Good morning and welcome back to Culture and the Environment. In this unit, we're going to talk about agriculture. So broadly, agriculture means the tending of plants and animals in processes of natural growth, typically for food production, but also for the production of other kinds of crops and products for different uses. So in the first unit of this course, uh, you learn that the word culture itself, which is fundamental to anthropology, is the big concept, that it's about human disposition, worldviews, and the things we take for granted. The word culture is etymologically related to agriculture, at least in Romance languages and in English. What is the word for agriculture in your language? So culture, Cultivation is a tending, a taking care of a natural growth process. Choosing seeds, replanting them each season, feeding animals, attracting them into the home, training them for particular tasks or dispositions, burning forests to shape vast tracts of landscapes, uh, to encourage the growth of edible plants and to redirect animals for the hunt. These are ways in which humans have deeply shaped uh, this planet through practices of cultivation. Agriculture is also an honoring, attending to the transcendental and spiritual. Remember, the word cult is connected uh, etymologically. Practices of tending to the land, to plants and animals often provide rich metaphors for thinking about human identity and subjectivity and a collective sense of belonging as well as history. We sometimes think of roots as the connections we hold with ancestors, the historical legacies that we carry with us. But people like plants and animals are highly mobile and cultural practices are ever changing and always in interaction with others. There is a story, it's a simple story that is sometimes told about the origins of agriculture. The story goes as such. Early humans used to be nomadic hunter-gatherers and then nomadic pastoralists and then they discovered agriculture. They settled, they formed city-states and states and empires relied on the accumulation of agricultural surplus which allowed to feed armies and priests and so forth. More revolutions changed agriculture again in the 17th century and agriculture became increasingly more productive. Small plots gave way to large land holdings and then slavery and colonialism produced the plantation as an agricultural and social and political form, particularly in uh, tropical regions. The devaluation of human labor in the use of enslaved people made it possible to e export enormous amounts of surplus commodities such as sugar, cotton and tobacco for a high profit. From the early 20th century, agriculture has been highly industrialized, high input and high yield and typically occurs on very large land holdings and scales. All these different agricultural forms that are just conjured in this brief history, this is a history is often told about the origins of agriculture and its development to this day. These agricultural forums, these kinds of work arrangements, these patterns of land holding and techniques have in fact existed for a long time but also continue to coexist. So I want you to kind of unpack this linear narrative and instead see it as a heterogeneous coming together of agricultural forms, often coexisting in the same place at the same time, sometimes in tension with one another. The story is often told as a linear arc of development from simpler to more complex form, and this is just not correct. So for example, the selective breeding of plants precedes livestock herding and animal domestication by thousands of years. Early humans, we know, were very skilled gatherers and only occasional hunters of big game. And often people left their settled agricultural societies to undertake nomadic lives. Humans settled only when they had to. In most cases, settled agriculture is not a great deal. It involves a lot of work, not a lot of food security, and the potential for your food surplus to accrue somebody's power over you.
So by around 10,000 to 8,000 years ago, humans are planting lentils, peas, chickpeas, flax, batch, and about 2,000 years later, domesticated pigs, goat, and sheep appear. I'm talking about an era, a geographical era that's uh, known as the Fertile Crescent. These, however, are not settled agrarian states and are not using complex irrigation infrastructure to support the tending of these crops. One interesting point here is that you can see that domesticated grains and livestock precede sedentary states societies by about 4,000 years. An archaeologist called Jennifer Pornell has recently studied the Mesopotamian landscape of eight to 9,000 years ago. There were extensive wetlands in areas that are today quite arid. And these wetlands and marshes provided opportunities for hunting, fishing, foraging, and gathering in, in a variety of ecological settings and biomes. This was a place that was rich with resources, and the resources were ecologically varied, which is always a good uh, food gathering uh, strategy to have a backup plan when things go wrong. People lived on small elevated hills and planted grains and seeds in fertile beds that emerged as the waters retreated seasonally. There's a historian and political scientist called Jim Scott, and he's argued that these wetland societies have been overlooked by the narrative that presumed that sedentarianism only emerged in the context of grain producing strategies of production. Here you have a, a, a sedentary society that practices agriculture in the wetland, but also practices nomadic hunter-gathering in the area. These are mixed food production strategies coexisting at the same place. And this defies the simple story that I told you a little before. Jim Scott also points out that the diversity of the food supply and the food sources that people would gather from wetland ecologies made it quite hard for state forms to emerge. In fact, states need simpler and more regular ecologies and economies to exist. So consider the advantage of being able to move to find food, taking advantage of seasonal rhythms and of different biomes. So then the question becomes, why did people settle at all? Sedentary agriculture is highly labor intensive, but it's also risky and it breeds a whole set of new zoonotic diseases that have been well known for as early as humans and other animals have come to share their living quarters and as population density has increased in the settlements. So pathogen for diseases like smallpox, tuberculosis, typhus, bubonic plagues, cholera, and many other infectious diseases are already thriving in this early large and more complex Neolithic villages. In fact, early Mesopotamian populations, as well, as well as people living in a population density alongside animals all over the globe, very early on understand the dynamics of contagion and implemented isolation measures and quarantine for long distance travelers. Sounds familiar? So one of the main points here is that ideas about ideal cultivation forms has often been projected in the past to explain the lives of early human society. The cultural evaluation of marsh drainage and land reclamation and of irrigated agriculture was at, at, at some time projected back into the archaeological record to explain the rise of early agrarian states. But the archaeological record uh, presents a more complex picture, one in which wetland ecologies have been very important to early agriculture in places like Mesopotamia, and also where different subsistence activities coexisted and, and would continue to coexist. Now, I'm going to leave the weeds of this argument to the real card-carrying archaeologists. I want to jump ahead to the current moment. And specifically, I want to give you a vocabulary we're talking about agriculture as a social scientist. If you grow and harvest from the same field every year, year after year, you are a sedentary farmer and you're doing settled agriculture. If you clear a patch of forest and then plant a crop, and harvest it and then let the forest grow back in the same side before planting again in the same place, at which point you have to clear the forest to do that, then 
you are a Sweden cultivator. And if you use fire to clear the forest patch, which has advantage of improving soil fertility, and also it's, it's quite uh, labor efficient, and if done well, can help you manage the, for the forest and prevent larger fires. This is what is called slash and burn agriculture. You can think of agricultural societies in terms of land holding patterns. So some of the key terms here are a smallholders, who is a farmer or most typically a family of farmers who owns a small plot of land. Land can be held as a common shared between a group of people and managed through customary rules for use and sharing. Land can be privately held by a person or a corporation or it can be rented. So if you're cultivating on somebody else's land and you pay them, with a proportion of your harvest each season, then that makes you a sharecropper. You are sharing your crop. Often uh, sharecropping rates are really, really high. Being a sharecropper is, uh, often means being quite poor. If you provide your own tools and pay rent for the land that you are farming, the land owned to someone else, and you're renting it in cash, that's what's typically called a tenant farmer. If you're growing crops, in exchange for a salary on somebody else's field, then you're an agricultural wage worker. If you're growing food for your own and your family and your community's consumption, you are a subsistence farmer. If you are growing things to sell to markets for money, these things are cash crops. And these are not mutually exclusive forms and economies. And you often see them coexist or or taking shape with, with particular arrangements. I think the specificity is key here, but I want to give you a broad vocabulary. The word peasant is used a lot in the literature and peasant, it's a confusing word because it can refer to either smallholders or wage agricultural workers or tenants or sharecroppers. Agricultural laborers can be coerced into doing this work and this can take the form of slavery involuntary captivity, forced labor with lack of compensation, also deprived of equal legal standings and rights. But coercion can also come about through debt structures that force a person to work on someone else's lands or by providing opportunity to a group of migrants and then exploiting the bureaucracy of migration such as that the migrant farmer becomes tied to this particular kind of agricultural work. Large commercial farms often hold a monopoly over where workers live, what they eat, and how they are transported to the fields, and charge for these living expenses out of uh, workers' pay. Now I want to talk about the plantation, which is typically a colonial form of agricultural production. It indicates a very large holding, often located in a tropical setting, and it cultivates monocrops for commercial exports through the use of enslaved or otherwise exploited workers. In the contemporary moment, the word plantation refers to a large commercial agricultural operation producing a single export crop. For this unit, you have read two articles which center on some of the most prevalent form of commercial agriculture today, the industrial monocrop. It's industrial because it makes use of heavy machinery, chemical inputs, and complex industrial processing systems. And it travels across wide markets. It's a monocrop because it produces one singular crop. So one of the articles you read is by anthropologist Tanya Murray Lee. And the article traces the effect of the expansion of commercial palm oil plantations in Indonesia. The other article is by an anthropologist called Craig Hetherington, and it's about Paraguayan farmers who have experienced the arrival of industrial soybean agriculture. The articles ask somehow different questions. Lee theorizes this special form of the contemporary plantation and argues that this form inevitably creates a social system predicated on violent extractions at all levels of power and labor. Hetherington focuses on the conditions that make it possible for farmers' claims about the deadly effects of soybean cultivation to gain legal and social legitimacy. So I'm moving to 
Craig Hetherington's ar article now. So in eastern Paraguay, soy cultivation has recently replaced cotton, which in turn had replaced the Amazon forest. Campesinos, small-scale farmers who have been allured to clear the forest in the 1960s and embraced the planting of cotton for export markets, suddenly found themselves contending with droughts, with diseases, with very low market prices for corn, and they just stopped growing it. It just wasn't a sustainable um, kind of work anymore. Enter Brazilian farmers, mostly of German origins and of the most impoverished of the Brazilian soy growers. They start growing GMO soy in the eastern Paraguayan lands. They're taking advantage of gaps in environmental regulation and enforcement in this border area. So growing soy, soy has been domesticated for thousands of years, but today commercial soy plantations, it's a form of agriculture that requires very high capital investment. And the structures of debt that these Brazilian German farmers enter into to purchase the heavy equipment, the fuel, the agrochemicals that they need to grow soy, in turn make them dependent on those that provide them with seeds and, and with silos who front the cash for the operation. So the Paraguayan campesinos, the farmers, the former cotton farmers, they understand that soy cultivation is a form of dependency. And in fact, they often refuse to take part, even as day laborers. Soon, however, the campesinos who continue living at the edge of the soy field become exposed to toxic herbicides as well as to violent land grab practices. So critics argue that campesinos, in fact, had a mental block against the kind of economic development opportunity that soybean presented, or that they were using soybean as a pretext for revolution or social unrest. But the larger story that Hetherington calls attention to was one in which agrarian decline, depopulation, toxic exposure and economic marginalization were entangled with the arrival of these fairly deadly practices of soybean agriculture. So where they lost a legal battle, and you can read all about it in the article, questions about the outcomes of industrial soy agriculture became embraced by the broader public in Paraguay and abroad, as well as by NGOs and the press. But Hetherington ends the article with a set of open questions. How are we to understand the campesinos' suspicion of more quote-unquote responsible forms of large-scale corporate soil production? How are we to understand their refusal to see the Brazilian soy farmers as potential allies? Or the demands for cotton subsidies and an expectation of police protection and of ongoing economic opportunities? Some of these questions are also about the positioning of the researcher as an ally to disenfranchised communities. And others are about the ethical perspectives and scales from which we, we can address complex problems like the rise of agro-industrial soy and the structures that constrain people's demand for justice and for their livelihood rights. The second article you have read for this unit is written by anthropologist Tanya Lee and it is an analysis of palm oil plantation form as an ongoing kind of colonial style corporate monoculture of industrial crops. Indonesia, it's an interesting place to look at that because it's the country with the biggest expansion of palm oil in the contemporary moment with more than 20 million hectares and growing, making it one of the world's leading producers. So together, Indonesia and its neighbor Malaysia produce 85 to 95% of the world's palm oil, which is used in food processing, but also has industrial application. Palm oil plantations accounted for half of Indonesia's deforestation in the past two decades. While the ecological impacts of palm oil plantations are quite well known and have been reported widely in recent years in the international press, Tanya Lee's article examines the everyday life and work of one such plantation in the Indonesian province of West Kalimantan. Her argument is that 
the monopoly of resources, the system for acquiring land, and the spatial organization of the plantation inevitably will give rise to violence at all levels. Everyone, in fact, needs to take part into an extensive and pervasive systems of predation and plunder, from the seasonal landless workers to the paid workforce to the tenant farmers in the outgrower schemes, the field supervisors, the buyers, the truck drivers, the managers and the investors. The form of the plantation, the space of the plantation is peculiar. In contrast to other kinds of agricultural landscapes, it typically starts from an empty, empty slate. Existing vegetation is removed, hills and other topographic features are flattened as much as possible, settlements are repossessed and abandoned and destroyed, water is diverted into irrigation and drainage systems, a grid of road is built to move workers, equipments and produce as well as the agrochemicals used to manage the crop that quickly start to percolate water sources in the region and affect the drinking water of nearby remaining settlements. Plantation workers in Indonesia, as well as in many other similar kinds of operation, are typically migrant workers. And pause for a second and kind of ask yourself, why is the migrant worker the ideal worker for this kind of exploitative agricultural production. Just write down what your answers could be. So Lee points out that migrant workers typically are separated from their networks of kins and from their ethnic communities and from other ways of forming solidarity and organizing. And so they're much less likely to organize and cooperate to demand different labor conditions, for example. Plantation managers uh, typically enforce policing and disciplinary punishment internally. They also provide housing, food and transportation and healthcare. And so they really hold a monopoly on the workers' lives. Older pre-existing settlements are destroyed or entirely bypassed by the new plantation roads or incorporated into outgrowing schemes where tenant farmers rent land uh, that, uh, that belongs to the plantation and, and, and sell it to the same commercial networks of the plantation. And then over time, sometimes they're able to acquire that land as their own. So unlike other extraction activities like logging, the plantation leaves, Tanya Lee tells us, a very long-standing and enduring imprint on the landscape. It looks as if it's really there to stay for a long time. This overwhelming spatial extent, this material fixity, and I'm using Lee's words here, account for what she sees as this inevitable effects of entrenched and routine exploitation, violence, and predatory relations. As you consider these two different approaches, one calling attention to the structure and one calling attention to some of the possibilities for agency within it, I just want to end this lecture with a question for you. It's a big question, but I would like your answers to be as detailed as you can. What to you is good agriculture? What do you think makes just an ethically good agricultural production in the current moment? Just write down your answers and I look forward to sharing it in the class. So thank you again for joining me and I look forward to seeing you all very soon.